So we are coming to the end of a series that was dedicated to practical reasoning, reasoning about various types of issues. And we saw certain general principles, and then we saw certain applications to particular issues, in particular what some of the evidence that can be presented in favor of the truthfulness of the tradition. Uh, next week we'll start a series um, on the Haggadah, and uh, that will start Monday, because I'm going to be out of the country for a few days. <coughs> and tonight I want to end with a, with a final general um, picture of the different ways, some of the different ways in which you can respond to a critique, or in general to argue against the position that you think is mistaken. Uh, I'm going to present three. Two are very famous in philosophy and very widely discussed. The third is not really uh, given any prominence, maybe because it's obvious and doesn't need discussion, but I think in actual, uh, dis- in actual um, argumentation, the third is also extremely important. A person takes a position that Q is correct. So, um, one thing you could do is simply cite reliable sources that Q is not correct. And if he has no answer for you, then that shows that he's made a mistake. That's a very strong response. We are, you are showing that he's wrong. A different type of response is where you ask him for his reason for believing in Q, and you show him that his reason isn't a good reason. That means that he should withdraw his support for Q. It means that he can't justify accepting Q, but Q might be true for all, for all the critics, for all the critic of him knows, all, all that is being pointed out. It's just that the source that he used isn't a reliable source. So, for example, someone says, I believe in Q because it says so in the encyclopedia. I said, really? Show it to me. And he shows it to me, open page, there it says right in the encyclopedia, that Q is correct. I'm a little surprised, because I don't think Q is right. And then I turn back to the front piece, and I notice that this, the, the copyright of this edition of the uh, of the encyclopedia is from 1956. <laughs> okay, okay, it is an encyclopedia, but a lot has happened in 80 years, you know. Could very well be that uh, the world has changed its mind on this. This is not a reason to accept Q just because it says so in a 80-year-old encyclopedia. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm saying he has no right to think that his Accepting Q is justified, and certainly I don't have to accept it if that's his reason for accepting it. So that's where you undermine his evidence, you undermine his support for what he believes. And those two are very valuable things to do. There's a third, which I guess in a certain sense, could be thought of as a, as a subcase of the second, but I think it's different enough to deserve its own separate treatment. And that is to point out that he himself is not consistent in using the principles that he based Q on. He says, I believe in Q because of A, B, and C. I say, well, that's interesting. If you believe in A, B, and C, if that's your basis for Q, then A, B, and C ought to take you to Z also. Do you believe in Z? And Z often is sometimes something absurd, something absolutely ridiculous. So what I say to him is, I'm not commenting on whether whether Q is correct or not. I'm not even commenting on whether the information that you're using to support Q is correct or useful. But I'm commenting on you as a thinker you aren't consistent in your own principles. <coughs> Which then 
leads one to be to to the suspicion that he's not really relying on A, B, and C. He's using A, B, and C post facto as a kind of justification in argumentation, but really he's, he's, he's accepting Q for some other reason, some kind of prejudice. Now let's take the three of these and apply them to a, a single type of case, which is very much topical, and that is Holocaust denial. Which is growing in popularity. Um, so, the first thing you could do is you could bring a raft of materials describing the Holocaust and, of course, treating it as a real historical event. Some Holocaust deniers will simply refuse to accept the testimony from those materials. First, they'll tell you those materials are put out by Jews and Jews are lying to the world. You point out, excuse me, we have documents from the German government and we have documents from, uh, from non-Jewish countries that have taken the position officially and so forth and so on. So then they say, um, well, after the Second World War, since the Germans were trying to destroy the Jews and, and not, but didn't succeed with the Holocaust, but since they certainly were against the Jews, and since they lost the war, and the victors write history, and those who are on the bylines know that the victors are the ones who are in control of history. So since the Germans were against the Jews, and the Allies uh, conquered them, so then, of course, you have to be in favor of the Jews. That's why the story is spread, and the story is given credence, just because of the outcome of the war. But there's no reason to accept it as, as uh, correct. And then they say, if you talk about the uh, records from the concentration camps and the t- testimony of Jews in the concentration camps, were they objective? Were they cool-headed? Did they have to, uh, access to other people so they could check the, their observations over and so on? It was under terrible stress. Um, and uh, you don't trust the Germans for anything else. Why do you trust the Germans for this? Uh, this is the kind of argumentation that they use to dismiss these sources, <coughs> which... We say, um, we say, uh, um, show that this, the Holocaust was, was a real historical event. If you uh, try to, if you, add, if you try to undermine their denials, they simply say that all of the material that is presented in favor is prejudiced material. We can argue that that's so, and therefore there's no reason to believe in it. I don't have to show it didn't happen. There's no reason to believe that it did happen. And that's enough. The third uh, method of, of arguing is to ask them, do you believe in the United States Civil War? United States Civil War. 1860 uh, to 1865. Now, if he says no, then I think in public you've won the debate. Look, this guy doesn't believe in the, in the United States Civil War, you know, so he's off, he's off the page. But if he says yes, then you ask him, well, why do you think your evidence for the, uh, the Civil War in the United States, which took place 150 years ago, no survivors, very little original material, is better then the evidence is being presented in favor of the Holocaust. Why do you think your evidence for the United States Civil War is better than evidence for the Holocaust? And if he can't answer that question, then that means that he's not really following the evidence. He's not really rejecting the Holocaust on the grounds that the evidence isn't strong enough. Because if the evidence for the Civil War is weaker than that, then, now, actually, some people say, repeating what I said before, but in a different, different context, well, the evidence for the Civil War is non-Jewish evidence. And the evidence for the Holocaust is Jewish evidence. And I think at this point, you, you push the same argument further. Okay, so you don't trust Jewish evidence. What is your evidence that Jewish evidence isn't trustworthy? 
what is it that you know from other sources is true and the Jews have said otherwise. You can't just use the idea that Jewish sources are untrustworthy. You have to have a reason for that. You're saying that here are sources, written sources, photographic sources, and all the rest, and they're portraying a certain, a certain event, and you don't trust them. Well, you have to have a reason for not trusting them. If they have a bad track record, something else. But let's see it. Let's see it. Um, and then, if they can't do that, then their claim to be following the evidence isn't a good claim. And then sometimes they backtrack and say, well, maybe we shouldn't believe in the, the American Civil War either. But then I think you, you, you've won the battle. Uh, you can make it even more brutal. Do you believe that Americans walked on the moon? What's your evidence for that? How many people saw it directly? Couldn't Hollywood have had a mock-up of the walk on the moon and, and broadcast it? in 1968, 69, when we saw it? Uh, wouldn't it be to the interest of the United States to um, claim such a technological uh, uh, accomplishment to put fear into other countries and so forth and so on? I mean, there's certainly an incentive to do it, the amount of evidence for the for America's walk on the moon is almost nil. Real evidence. <clears throat> so at that point, if he if he says, "Well, I don't believe that that uh, uh, that America's walked on the moon," again in public, you've won the argument because they'll be just regarded as crazy. Now, actually, let me add a footnote at this point. Actually, I think there is a good argument for trusting the claim of the United States to have walked on the moon. In spite of the fact that the direct evidence that the observers, hundreds of millions of Americans, have available to them is almost nil. And that's because not one of the bitter enemies of the United States who regularly lie about what's going on in the United States said that they didn't walk on the moon. Even Russia and China didn't say we, walk, uh, didn't, say we didn't walk on the moon. So these people who lie about us, I, I lived in Boston for a while. It was a, someone who got out of Russia in the 1980s. And they, he was brought to Boston and he walked into a supermarket and he almost fainted. Because America is where people are starving, where the capitalists have everything and the workers have nothing. And, um, and Russia is the workers' heaven, where they're treated as, uh, with, with equality. He'd never seen so much food in one place in his life. He never dreamed of there being so much food in one place in his life. And there are thousands of supermarkets in America. And these are average people who are going in and buying there. So this country, which lies about the United States right and left, even they didn't say that we were making up the story of walking on the moon. Why not? If there isn't any real evidence, it's just a made-up story, it's just a conspiracy, then why didn't our enemies who lie about us continuously lie about this also and say... <coughs> <coughs> and say, obviously they felt it was impossible to, re to really contradict. But this guy you're talking to probably won't have thought of that. And um, you simply say to him, if you, if, you, if you do believe that they walked on the moon, so then your, your, your criteria are not consistent. Now, this applies to very many issues here you have to know who you're talking to. You have to know probably what he believes in, what he doesn't believe in, and so on and so on. Um, for example, the question of whether the rules of ethics or morality are real rules that have real authority and really bind people, or whether they're just made up. Some kind of so relativism or nihilism in ethics. Now, there was a story... I, I didn't see the story, but I heard about it in the Wall Street Journal maybe 50 years ago. A student in a philosophy class is writing a paper on ethics, and he takes the position that there are no binding ethical norms. And then he writes his arguments, and the professor gives him an F. So he marches into the professor's office and says, why did you give me an F? 
And the professor says, because you're wrong. And the student says, prove it. Prove that I'm wrong. So the professor takes out the standard proofs, and for each proof, the student says, that's not right, I don't agree, I think that's nonsense, no, you haven't convinced me, and so forth and so on. He rejects all the arguments. At the end of the, the, that discussion, the student says, so you see, none of your arguments work, and so you have to change my grade. And the professor said, no, my principle for grading is, I give A's to the ones who agree with me, and I give F's to the ones who disagree with me. That's my principle. And the student says, but you can't do that. It's not right. You didn't convince me. My position is correct. End of story. Um, what was this paper about? There aren't any binding moral rules? What is he yelling at the professor? You can't do that? It isn't right? The professor says, I operate with a different rule. Hmm. What's exactly going on in a student's mind? if you call it a mind. So when you read that story, I think you're certainly sympathetic to the student. He's being victimized, no question about it. But his logic is off. You can't say in one breath that there are no binding norms and, and, and in the second breath, tell somebody else what he has to do because of the norms that bind him. So that means that the student isn't really presenting a consistent picture of where his mind is. He's doing something else. And I'll tell you what he's doing after I give you another example. That's just something that was in the Wall Street Journal, but I, I was a professor of, of, of philosophy from in, in the 70s, and this is what you heard from students a lot, real students. On the one hand, when norms were discussed and debated and uh, people uh, spoke in favor the, of, of the bindingness of certain norms. They were all relativistic. Don't tell me what to do. Don't shove your ethics down, down, down my throat. Uh, everybody leaves, lives as he pleases. Everybody chooses his own ways to go. And there's nothing that binds anybody. <coughs> but when they wanted to make a demonstration and the university clamped it down, called the police and broke it up, then they complained that we were violating their rights. Well, again, um, if there aren't any binding norms, if everybody does what they like, what kind of rights are you possessing? How can you use your rights as a way to condemn what the university is doing? The university is just protecting its interests. And certainly not going to listen to you because you're threatening their interests. So what's going on is this. Psychologically, the student wants to get people off his back. And he uses whatever, whatever slogan will work in the circumstances. So when other people are trying to convince him that he has certain responsibilities or there's certain limits of what he can do, then he's a relativist and says, no rules are, are binding, no rules uh, are, are valid, no rules are objective, everybody does what he wants. But when they're interrupting his freedom to act, then all of a sudden rights are binding and rights are universal and it's wrong for you to, 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 to contradict somebody else's rights. This, the common theme is only psychological. The common theme is get off my back. And that means that his, reason, his, his stated reasons for what he's doing, for what he believes, are just not, they're not correct. They're not really his reasons. Now he may be not lying um, consciously, but Logically, those aren't his reasons, because if they were, he couldn't have, had ta couldn't have taken both positions uh, simultaneously. And you see this sort of thing all, all the time. Um, you, you see this uh, certainly in, in what's going on with respect to Israel worldwide, these kinds of, these kinds of contradictions. Um, this, I think, is the bite in what uh, Jordan Peterson answered, he answered a lot of things, but when he was asked about pronouns, why won't you use my chosen pronouns? Why don't you have respect for me and use the pronouns that I choose? <coughs> so I'm not boiling it down to one thing. He said several things, and, and I think each of them had, had uh, some very important logical import. But one of the, one of the things he said is, um, I'm a psychologist. 
He had over 100 published papers in psychological journals, and he had vast surprise of practice in psychology. And he said, I don't think it's good for you if I use your pronouns. I think there's a certain narcissism driving you. You want power. You want power, and you want to have your identity enshrined. And since you can't earn a living, and you can't drive a truck, and you can't fly a plane, you're really powerless, all 19 years of you. So where are you going to get that confirmation that you're powerful? Like they used to say 20 years ago, empowering. They didn't mean what's going on today. They meant giving people the ability to do things that they need to do. Here, the empowering is shouting somebody down when you have nothing to say, so you just make noise so he can't talk because he might have something to say. And here, I can force you to use the pronouns that I choose. I can force you to talk the way I want you to talk. Well, that might not be good for the person. It might not be helpful for his psychology. It might just reinforce a sickness in his way of relating to the world, which will lead him ultimately to disaster. And Peter says, as a psychologist, I can't do that. I'm sorry. Let alone free speech and all the rest, which are also important, important arguments. Where, you have to ask yourself where it's coming from psychologically. A lot of what's going on on the campuses is a, is a, is a reflection of correctly perceived powerlessness. The average sophomore and junior on a college campus has no power at all. And between you and me, they don't deserve any. The other thing was respect. You don't respect me enough? He said, what have you done to earn my respect? You think that everybody should be respected no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter what they are, no what their values are and priorities are, no matter what their activities are? Why? Explain that to me, why everybody should be respected. Respect is something that you earn by doing or being something of value. Especially if you did it for yourself. Even if you were trained in it, still a certain respect. But if not, why should I respect you? These are code words, that's all. If, I, if, if, you, if a person asks for respect and you say, no, ha, you're a, you're, you're a, um, a bigot and, and so forth and so forth. But not necessarily so. Not necessarily so. so this is the, the, the psychological platform from which, from which they're operating is this psychological platform of powerlessness. <coughs> the real thing to do is to try to find something that's worthwhile and they can do and challenge them to do that so they'll have the satisfaction of really accomplishing something and then build from there. That's why Peterson says, clean up your room. Don't save the planet from global warming. Clean up your room. And then clean up your personal relationships. You have good relationships with the members of your family? No? Clean that up. Repair that before you repair the planet. Because you haven't got a clue what the planet's problems are. You haven't got a clue what repair would mean. You haven't studied the subject. You know the slogans. You wave the flags. Because that makes, gives you a feeling of power. But it's false power because it won't, it won't, it won't improve anything. It won't change anything. You want to ask a question? Mm. Oh, yeah. Why does uh, this like complicated uh, internal issue always end up um, on the surface coming out as a blatant contradiction? Like uh, there are no, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as morals, and then and then they're shown that they're obviously like, contradicting themselves based on what they're like the next sentence kind of. How does it play, play itself out all the time as a blatant contradiction? How does it play itself out as a blatant contradiction? I'm not quite sure what you mean. It, isn't it clear that saying on the one hand there are no binding norms and saying on the other hand you can't violate my rights is a contradiction? I'm saying how do they get to that point where they say that? Uh, they, they, because they're I... Up, they're messed up on the inside, but then they get to that point where they say something... That just destroys their, their own agenda. You see. How did they read the point of contradiction? Yeah, um, 
I'm not a psychologist, so I, I, can, I can sort of speculate from the outside. I guess a psychologist would do some anyway. I'm not that big a fan of psychology in general. Uh, but some psychologists would probably do a better job than I could. But first of all, they respond to a particular stimulus at a particular time. And they say what they think will move the person, you know, at that time. Um, and to keep in mind, well, this is what I said to him under that stimulus, and this is what I said to him under that stimulus, unless they care about consistency, unless they care about being logical, unless they care about someone who's going to say, hey, you said that over there, you said that over there. If they don't do that to each other, that's not part of their discussion to say, you said this on Tuesday and this on Thursday, how does it work fit together? If they don't do that, then it doesn't, doesn't occur to them. They just respond to the, <coughs> to the stimulus at the moment. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things I used to teach in university was logic. I thought symbolic logic, but there was plenty of reasoning going on. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a job. But I taught at Johns Hopkins, which is not a bad school. Um, one fellow, uh, we taught a joint course in philosophy of perception with a colleague, and it, there was a midterm paper, which he wrote, and we gave him a D. And he came storming into our offices. We had joint offices. And he said, you can't do that to me. I mean, this is like after seven weeks of, of a 14-week course in philosophy, right? So we said, why can't we do that? And he said, because philosophy is what you truly believe. And this is what I truly believe. Hmm. We've been reading different positions in perception um, since that, a theory and direct perception and realism, so forth and so on, arguments for this one and arguments for that one and where the shortcomings were and where the, re the remaining problems were. And after seven weeks, all he got was, philosophy is what you truly believe. So if you write what you truly believe, you get an A. I don't know. It was kind of hard to, you know, deal with that. He just like, he's got this fixation and seven weeks of teaching didn't budge him, didn't, didn't make a dent. So... You, you, you have that. <laughs> I had another student. I, 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 it, was the, it was like the seventh week of, in the 14-week course, and the, 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 whole, the whole course was based on a final paper. So he says to me, um, I'd like to discuss the, uh, the topic for my final paper. I said, it's the seventh week. You know, we're going to cover a lot of material. between Maybe in the tenth week you should do that, but they take two weeks to write the paper. He says, no, because if I fix my, pipe, my, my topic now, I don't have to read the rest of the material. He told me that to my face. So, did he think he was going to impress me? Get me to say yes? I mean, <laughs> it was like bizarre. Anyway, so um, students, <coughs> I had a certain bitter experience with students which made it easier for me to leave academia. I think the microphone might not be working. Yeah, I know, you're right, but we have microphones here. There are, there are portable microphones here. For the, for the, thank you very much for pointing it out. Um, so, uh, this now is when you, when, you, when you hear somebody take a position, and if a person speaking out of prejudice, then this is going to be very common. It'll be, it'll be typical. If he's speaking out of prejudice and you ask him for his reasons, it'll be very common that take those reasons and apply them to something else, and you'll see that his conclusion won't, won't follow those reasons. In fact... Rabbi Meiselman used this, this argumentation, I would say, in a certain sense, backwards. He wrote a book on, uh, called Jewish Woman and Jewish Law. This is in the 70s. And there are a lot of feminist critiques of Judaism because of the role of women in Judaism. And he set out the following challenge. One of the critiques is that all the scholars of the law are male, and that makes them inherently prejudiced. Um, so he said, okay, take the corpus of Jewish law, especially the Talmud, with a lot of argumentation, disagreements, and see if you can find certain principles that are used in the discussion of property law and criminal law and testimony and judges and uh, fraud and so forth and so on. And then show that when it comes to discussing legal issues applying to women, those principles aren't used consistently. 
They violate those principles. That would be a way of having evidence of prejudice. Because evidence of prejudice is, not only, but, but is that the principles you use for discussing the subjects which you're not prejudiced about aren't the principles that you use when you're discussing the subjects you are prejudiced about. <coughs> That's one of the ways that you show prejudice. No one ever answered his challenge. And the, and, the, and the reason is very simple, because if you study the Talmud, it's open field on everything at once. Everything is linked to everything else. Everything is cross-referenced to everything else. And the principles used in one place are chested by their application elsewhere, which means that you're not going to find any systematic set of principles for everything except women. Then when you come to women, a different kind of argumentation. It's just not going to happen. But if it's not going to happen, that means there's no evidence of prejudice. So this is, this is the way in which you can attack people uh, that way. Now, one of the points that, that Israel has been making in the United Nations for decades, you're against genocide. You're against uh, killing innocents. But there are many places on earth where that goes on all the time. Sometimes by the, uh, the government of the country itself, which is the dictatorship, and sometimes by uh, violent groups within the government, and you, and you haven't got a word to say about it. North Korea, and, and these people who think of themselves as progressives, you know, uh, su supporting proxies of Iran, when in terms of women's rights, uh, um, LBGTQ+, plus, whatever it is, right? So you, I would invite them to do, take a tour of Gaza, of Gaza. If, they, if you identify yourself, self, they'll throw you off the roof of the nearest building. They have no use for you. They have no use for, you, no use for your way of life or your rights. These are the people that you're supporting? Palestine free? Free of what? Free to do what? Free of Jews. I hear that. But certainly not free under Hamas. What kind of freedom is that? So you say that you're in favor of all these different all these different um, progressive values, you aren't really. You aren't really. I, real, I realized just, just recently that they have an answer to this. It's just that it, ultimately it's not logical. And that is we align with other oppressed groups whether we agree with what they would do with their freedom or not because that gives us more power for a fighting, a fighting oppression. Okay, but then you aren't doing this in principle. You're just doing this for power. Which, again, would be consistent on their part because they say the world is only power. There's only power and that's all that ever, and has ever been just a matter of power. That's demonstrably wrong because there are times when people with the power curb their own power. If it was all about power, that couldn't be the case. <coughs> when the United States outlawed slavery, that wasn't about power. That was about losing power because of the wrongness of slavery. When the United States voted that women should have the vote, that was giving up male power. That wasn't about power, it was about giving up male power because it's wrong to deny women the vote from a democratic point of view. So if you see the people with the power voluntarily giving up the power, so then you can't put that down to simply being a matter of exercising power. So there, their, their, uh, their position is inconsistent with the facts. But they don't care about the facts. What they care about is doing something that will give them the illusion of being powerful, like shutting down speakers. Um, the, real, the real power is convincing people. It can be argued that there's more power in convincing people than there is in, in, in atom bombs. Because the people have to, be, have, to, have to decide to use the bombs. And somebody convinced them of the values which lead them to use the bombs. A person who's a dictator of a country isn't a dictator because he has the biggest gun and he can shoot all his opponents. He has to convince the, the army to, to, to do his bidding. Uh, Romania was run by the Ceausescu's husband and wife, dictators, until one day 
The army didn't want them, and they were gone the next day. The power is the power of using your mouth to convince people of what needs to be done. Marching in the street with, with, with uh, flags and, uh, and shouting down the people who are speaking won't convince them. It may take people who don't need to be convinced, who live for likes on their social media accounts, and it may enthuse them, that's true, but people who, who, who need to be convinced will not be convinced by that. Yeah? What about like Kim Jong-un running North Korea? He's not really, maybe he is, but he's, he's running it with like terror, not convincing them. No, but who's enforcing the terror? Uh, he has to convince them. Otherwise, they'll, they'll throw him out. Uh, he convinces them by giving them good conditions. Okay, that's what went on in the Soviet Union also. <coughs> we had people who, who fled from the Soviet Union. The workers were starving, and the managers and people in the, in, the, in, the, in the party had two homes, one in the city, one in the land, and they bought all that stuff from Switzerland, and, you know, it was, uh, it was just simply a question of, of privilege. Using the privilege, using the power that they had to, to enslave the masses, um, and by the way, the masses in, in, in Russia knew exactly what was going on. There was no question of the bleeding propaganda. When Orsamech sent people there, one person there came back and he told he told us of the following observation. He was in Moscow, and in the park in Moscow there was someone selling burned out light bulbs. Now you think, why would somebody buy a burnt out light bulb? And here's the answer. He buys the burnout light bulb and puts it in his pocket. He goes to the factory, and when no manager is looking, he unscrews a working light bulb and puts in the burnout light bulb. And he puts the working light bulb in his pocket. Then a manager comes by and he sees a burnout light bulb. So he goes to the storehouse and gets a fresh one, takes out the burnt light bulb, puts the fresh one in, and sells the burnt light bulb to the guy in the, in the park. It's just a circle, ripping it off. Why? Because they knew that the, the, the government was ripping them off, so you rip them off. Do as you can. So the, the idea, and that's, I think, many say that that's what ultimately led to the demise of the Soviet Union. <coughs> because you couldn't convince people to really make sacrifices for it. And I think that's the reason why with 144 million people Russia cannot crush Ukraine, which has 40 million people. They have three and a half times as many people. Big country, Russia. And they just fight them to a standstill. Why is that? Because Russia is corrupt. Ukraine is also corrupt. But Russia is corrupt through and through. And each person is looking for, how can I make it good for myself? So shall I shoot or shall I duck? Mm, I think I'll duck. Because I'd like to come out of the war alive. You know? And, and, and that matter of spirit is something which you're not going to get in, the, in, in an autocratic regime which cares nothing for, its, for the rights of its people. At any rate, um, so that's what we're talking about, about uh, students. And the same thing is true, I made this point a few days ago, but now it, it comes out in a different context. When you're talking about the existence of God, the truth of a religion, um, people will use, they'll make up requirements and use standards with respect to religion that they won't use in the discussion of any other subject. One the standard is that they say, you have to prove to me that there is a God. I'm listening to listen. I'm willing to be objective, but prove it to me. You don't prove it to me, I'm not taking it. Well, let's see. Um, if I give you 60% evidence that a certain disease is spreading, will you take measures against it? That's not a proof. Why aren't you asking for a proof there? A proof. Um, your business is losing money. And there are three people who have access to the information. What are you going to do? Well, one thing a company will do under those conditions is fire all three. That way they'll stop the leak. But you don't know which one is doing it. 
That's true. So what? I can't take a chance. So I fire all three. Why don't you want a proof before you fire somebody? Because I'm protecting myself against something important, and uh, you know, I'll do. I'll take. I'll, I'll do it without a proof. Do you really require a proof in all the questions that you deal with in life? Let's say you decided to get married. You know that such a thing as divorce. You know that such a thing as unhappy marriages, especially outside religious Jewish context. Why don't you ask for a proof that you're going to have a good marriage before you make the decision to marry? And there, if you, if you make a mistake, or if it doesn't work out, which is not exactly the same thing, um, then there's going to be a lot of suffering, a lot of, a lot of loss. But you don't require a proof. So are you really consistent in saying, with respect to God, you want a proof, or are you protecting yourself against the conclusion? Doesn't sound like that's your general proposition about life. We mentioned, do you have a proof that you know who your parents are? How do you know your parents are? Who your parents are? They told you and you believed them. That's a proof. You say, I see my baby pictures and now I look like my parents. I, I share features with my parents. That's because your parents took their baby pictures when they went to the orphanage to pick out children. So they pick out babies who look like them when they were babies. Um, you, I, I did a DNA test. Well, first of all, I know you didn't. And second of all, if you did, maybe your parents paid off the lab to lie to you about the results. Do you have a proof of who your parents are? No. So why don't you just treat it as an unknown and discard them or do whatever is convenient for you and feel no responsibility to them because you don't live by proof. So why is your demand for proof here only here? Because you don't want the conclusion. So it's, it's again, an inconsistency in the standards that you're using. This is a very effective method of getting a person to think again, especially in public. <coughs> but an honest person who's trying to do the right thing and is making this mistake this is a very, very powerful way to um, correct him for making a mistake. Questions? Okay, as I said, on, on, on uh, Monday in Yitzhak we'll start with the Haggadah. Thank <laughs> you.